let me introduce you Christopher Pico, uh, Johnsonian Professor of Philosophy, Department of Philosophy, University of Columbia. Please, Christopher. Hello, okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Can you hear me okay? Is the audio okay? Yeah. Okay, good, thank you. Um, so, uh, the title of my talk is How to Be a, a Moral Realist, and what I want to do is to locate and develop a moral realist position within a, a general framework for considering realist treatments of arbitrary domains of thought, whatever the domain of thought is. And I'm going to be proposing very broadly a realistic and rationalist treatment of moral thought. In recent decades in the literature, ways of developing a rationalist and realist uh, treatment of moral thought have been very largely overlooked, I think. Writers have, have long realized that there must be treatments of morality that parallel rational treatments of mathematics, necessity, and other subject matters in which a priori knowledge plausibly plays a big role. Um, but they haven't said how such a parallel treatment of morality might run. And what I want to do in this talk is to answer that how question. How might we develop a realistic rationalist treatment of moral thought um, that's epistemologically metaphysically adequate and in certain respects parallels the treatment of arithmetic, mathematics and um, metaphysical modality, other cases where um, it's plausible that we need to have some kind of non-causal epistemology. Okay, let me zoom out to um, 40,000 feet uh, now and um, consider the range of, range of options available to us. For any domain and any family of concepts of entities in that domain, we can distinguish four exclusive and exhaustive possibilities. And by entity here, I mean entities in the broadest possible sense to include objects, properties, events, relations, whatever category. First possibility is this. Possibility is one in which the metaphysics of the entities in the domain, that is by metaphysics, I mean the account of what makes them the entities they are. The metaphysics is prior in the order of philosophical explanation to the account of the nature of the concepts of entities in that domain. So this is the metaphysics first possibility for domain and concepts of things in that domain. Second possibility is that neither the metaphysics of the entities nor the nature of the concepts is prior to the other. That's a no priority, no priority option. Third possibility evidently is that the nature of the concepts of the entities is prior in the order of philosophical explanation to the nature of the entities. That's a concept first or in linguistic formulation, meaning first possibility. And the fourth possibility, of course, is that the correct treatment of that domain um, should eliminate the notion of reference altogether. Um, and so these would be various kinds of expressivist or error kinds of theories. Um, so that's the classification of possibilities that I used in, in my last book in the, um, in the Primacy of Metaphysics. And in that book, I argued on very general grounds that there aren't any cases, there are no cases of the third kind, that the concept first or meaning first cases just don't exist for reasons of principle. Um, the arguments for that conclusion don't, don't matter at the, for present purposes. My concern in this paper is the proper location of moral properties and concepts within the other three categories. Various vigorous arguments have been presented in the literature on behalf of the theses that the moral case occupies the no priority category. Uh, equally vigorous arguments have been presented that it should be regarded as occupying the fourth, the non-referential category. My goal here in today's talk can be made more precise by simply saying that the, the variety of moral realism that I'll be developing and considering falls within the first of these possibilities, the metaphysics first case. My aim is to elaborate a tenable variety of a metaphysics first moral realism. Okay, so let me outline the, the components of that, that view. So uh, my general view, um, uh, held in common with various um, various people writing about concepts or senses, that, is that a concept or a way of thinking of an entity 
is individuated by the relation in which a thinker must stand to something in order to be thinking of it under that concept. So again, a concept, a way of thinking, is individuated by the relation in which a thinker must stand to something in order to be thinking of it under that concept. So we could say that for any concept C, there's a corresponding relation R of C that individuates the concept. So that relation features in a biconditional for any thinker and any entity. The thinker is in a position to think of the entity under that concept, just in case the thinker stands in that corresponding relation R of C to the entity. Various domains and concepts are distinguished by the nature of their corresponding individuating relations. In some metaphysics first cases, that relation is a causal one involving the thinker's perceptual states, as it plausibly is for perceptual demonstrative concepts of objects, such as that lamp or that desk when it's given to you in perception. Sometimes the relation involves the thinker being the subject of some particular conscious state or event, such as the relation that makes available this stabbing pain. If you're having a pain, you think about it in a particular way, it's made available to you by being the person who got that pain. But obviously neither causal nor ownership models seem the most plausible um, suitable candidates for parallels with the moral case. And um, I think we need to consider alternatives. Um, in the cases uh, where rationalist treatments have seemed plausible, such as natural numbers and modality, um, I think we should apply a principle that I called in that book, the principle individuation precedes representation principle individuation precedes representation. And I want to argue that we can develop an account of um, the metaphysics and understanding and epistemology of morality that applies that principle, the principle individuation precedes representation. So let me just remind you or give some illustrations of how that principle operates in certain cases. So consider for relative simplicity, the case of natural numbers. Each natural number the number itself, the natural number itself, not a concept of the number, the natural number itself is individuated by the condition uh, for it to be the number of Fs for an arbitrary property of F. So the natural number zero is individuated by the condition that for there to be zero Fs is for it to be the case that nothing is F. The number one is individuated by the condition that for there to be one F is for it to be the case that something is F and anything that's F is that same thing again, and so forth. These are points about the nature, the metaphysics of each natural number, about what makes it the number it is. It's a claim in ontology. We're not concerned here with the thinker doing the individuating. That's a legitimate notion, but a different one. Not concerned with thinkers or their attitudes at all. That's about the metaphysics of numbers. We can then ask if that's the account of the metaphysics, the individuation of the natural numbers, What's involved in thinking of a natural number as one, as the number one, and I claim that to do that is to have tacit knowledge of the condition that individuates the number one. And this tacit knowledge, like other cases of tacit knowledge, contributes to the explanation of thinkers judgments about the number one as such, such as that there's one lectern in the room and so forth. So if that's along the right general lines in the treatment of metaphysics and thought about natural numbers. The metaphysics of the natural numbers is prior in the order of philosophical explanation to these simple concepts of natural numbers. That is, we draw on the metaphysics, we draw on the account of what makes something that the number one, in the account of what it is to be able to think of that number as the natural number one. It's a case in which, as I'd say, individuation precedes representation. And in the case of natural numbers, such a treatment plausibly contributes to the integration of the theory of understanding, concept possession, with the metaphysics and epistemology of the natural numbers. Um, so there are two components to the general form of cases in which individuation precedes representation. There's first the metaphysics that individuates the entity, and there's second an account of grasp of certain concepts of these entities such that grasp of the concept consists in tacit knowledge of those very individuating conditions drawn from the metaphysics. Um, the principle-based treatment of metaphysical necessity that I suggested some time ago is of that general form too. Those are cases in which individuation precedes representation and cases in which, of course, grasp of the concepts on this account doesn't involve any kind of causal or perceptual relation. 
with those entities. So how might we apply this model to moral thought? Well, to do that, we have to ask what might be the metaphysics of the property of, for instance, the moral goodness of a state of affairs be? That's a substantive issue of morality. The principles individuate the property should certainly include the condition that states of affairs that involve the well-being of subjects or possibly benefits subjects are prima facie morally good. Benefit or well-being includes not just absence of suffering, but opportunities for close personal relations, a development of um, uh, subject capacities, other things of value. And there would also be a structural requirement requiring all kinds of careful formulation that what's involved in a good state of affairs can't be personal subject dependent, must be impartial in certain sense. It must value people and types of people equally. That's all part of the substantive metaphysics of what makes something a good state of affairs. So there's, of course, a large number of highly substantive questions within the metaphysics of morals relevant to the characterization of the property of moral goodness. Can it be individuated independently of the notion of a virtue? If not, we'd need to have a simultaneous account of virtue too. Same applies to the notion of value. Again, it's a substantive issue in the metaphysics of moral goodness where the value needs to enter as a further element. It would be governed by further principles, such as that everything that's of value is of value in some specific respect, and so on and so forth. The issue of whether all these constraints on being a morally good state of affairs can be given underlying unification, that also has to be addressed by a good metaphysics of the property. But considering the issues from this rather high level of um, this high level perspective at the moment, applying the principle of individuation precedes representation. What we then say next is that grasp of moral concepts involves some form of tacit knowledge of these conditions that individuate the property of being a morally good state of affairs. Tacit knowledge of the principles individuating the property of moral goodness would have various characteristics. The tacit knowledge may be highly incomplete. It may be accessed via the moral emotions. Its content will often include just prima facie propositions. And indeed, it will often epistemically be an open question whether promoting something really is to the benefit of subjects and so forth. So tacit knowledge of some components of the metaphysics of the moral properties contributes to features of moral thinkers judgments about various cases, example cases. And as always, attribution of tacit knowledge has to earn its keep by its explanatory power. Tacit knowledge of some principle that contributes to the individuation of moral goodness can explain its seeming to a thinker that a certain kind of state of affairs is good. Ordinary moral thinkers needn't have any special skill in articulating the tacit knowledge that helps to explain their judgments, just as they may have no ability to articulate the tacit knowledge that guides their intuitions about the grammaticality of a sentence of their own, own natural language. So the moral case is obviously immensely richer, more complex, philosophically well, less well understood than that of the natural numbers, or even I think that of metaphysical necessity. Nonetheless, it still seems to me that structurally we can still achieve in the same kind of integration of understanding metaphysics and epistemology that's present in those other cases. Understanding consists in likely partial grasp of metaphysics, along the lines of individuation precedes representation. Judgments explained by tacit and no doubt partial knowledge of that metaphysics will in basic cases be correct and knowledgeable for moral reality as delineated by that metaphysics. So that's a very brief and crude outline. Why do I call this metaphysics first and realistic treatment also a rationalist option? Well, in part it's a rationalist position because the treatment holds that grasp and corresponding knowledge of moral properties is founded in the understanding. Such a role for understanding has long been part of classical rationalist uh, positions. The account of grasp as tacit knowledge or some special psychological relation to what individuates moral property is one development of a rationalist conception of understanding. And more specifically, this is a moderate rationalism in important respect. The account, as I said, does not require any causal interaction, either by perception or any other causal or quasi-causal faculty with moral properties in order for a thinker to be employing moral concepts. And I'll discuss issues about the etiology, about the causation of particular moral beliefs um, 
imminently. This moderate mo rationalism also has a further rationalist aspect. It has the resources in combination with the theory of the a priori to explain why basic moral judgments are a priori in the traditional sense of being justificationally independent of experience. That too needs some elaboration. We should recognize cases of judgments based on seemings generated by tacit knowledge of a principle founded in the individuation of an entity as a distinctive kind of case of the a priori. Arithmetical judgments so based are one example of this kind, basic moral judgments are another. Judgments that come to be made in this way are guaranteed to be true in the actual world, whichever is the actual world. The contents of such judgments are guaranteed to be true by the very individuation of their subject matter, the individuation of natural numbers or the individuation of moral properties. By contrast, judgments based on seemings generated by tacit knowledge that's not founded in the individuation of the entity will not be a priori. Those will include judgments of grammatical algebra, sense of your own language, for instance. Well, someone may object, how can this possibly be a case of a priori knowledge? If the seeming hadn't occurred and it's part of the thinker's justification for the arithmetical or moral judgment, how can what's judged be justification independent of experience as is classically required for a priori status? Well, here we have to distinguish. We have to distinguish whether the justification exists and is independent from experience from the thinker's relation to that justification why it seems to the thinker to be a justification. The objective justification for a content that rests ultimately upon an individuating condition concerning its subject matter is seeming independent. The objective justification is a tree structure whose topmost node or nodes contain principles individuating some entity, a tree structure that involves truth preservation, that the root of the tree is the justified proposition. That could all be made formally precise for those like that. What matters is that the tree structure does not contain mental elements, nor is its structure mind dependent. By contrast, in the very different case of a posteriori perceptual justification, the objective justifying structure contains a perceptual state in the objective justifying structure itself. So that's a way of locating how this can be an account of a prior knowledge by distinguishing very sharply between objective justification of structures and the thinker's psychological relation to those structures. The same distinction should be made, of course, in the case of mathematical or logical proof. The, the mathematical or logical proof uh, considers a tree structure of, of sentences or of thoughts or propositions is, is mind independent. Um, thinkers have various different, uh, sometimes experiential dependent relations to those objective structures. Though the position I'm outlining is a rationalism about the epistemology of moral judgment, it's a further question whether it's rational to act in accordance with morality. It's yet another question whether we have most reason to act in accordance with morality rather than other values or norms. The rationalist metaphysics first account provides resources for addressing those questions, but addressing them involves further considerations. My task at the moment is simply to characterize a plausible metaphysics first treatment of the moral and contrast it with its rivals. A rationalist moral realism is not the only variety of moral realism. It contrasts with the classic statement of development of a naturalistic moral realism that was given by Peter Railton about 20 years ago now, in 2003. One significant point of contrast concerns the different nature of the warrant for moral beliefs that's proposed by rationalist and by naturalist versions of moral realism. As distinct from the fundamentally a priori form of justification for moral beliefs that's available on the rationalist view, Peter Railton writes, and I quote him, epistemic warrant may be tied to an external criterion as it is, for example, by causal or reliableist theories of knowledge. It's part of the naturalistic realism, Peter Railton writes, that informs this essay to adopt such a criterion of warrant. And again, he writes, the idea of causal interaction with moral reality would be intolerably odd if moral facts were held to be sui generis, but there need be nothing odd about causal mechanisms for learning moral facts if these facts are constituted by natural facts, and that's the view under consideration. And that's the end of the quote from Peter Alton. 
In the next section, I'm going to develop a rationalist and moralist treatment of justified moral beliefs that departs from causal or purely reliabilist models. But let me note two points in common between Peter Roughton's naturalistic moral realism and this present rationalist moral realism. First, at the center of Roughton's account is a notion of non-moral goodness that morality helps to promote. I've also used the notion of benefiting conscious subjects, a notion that must at least contain some non-moral elements if the account of moral properties and concepts is not to be circular. Second point of agreement between the rationalist and the naturalist versions of moral realism is a loosening of the alleged ties between the grasp of morality and acting in accordance with it. There's no acting in accordance with moral principles in no way written into this account of um, rationalist moral realism nor is it in Peter Ralton's account either. The moral realism I'm outlining here is to be distinguished from what Christine Korsgaard calls substantive moral realism. She draws a distinction, which I do accept, between procedural moral realism and other forms of moral realism. She writes, there's a trivial sense in which everyone who thinks that ethics isn't hopeless is a realist, I'll call this procedural moral realism. And again, she says, Substantive moral realism is the view that there are answers to moral questions because there are moral facts or truths which those questions ask about, unquote. So metaphysics first moral realism, the view I'm advocating, suddenly does hold that there are such questions to such answers to moral questions. But Christine Korsgaard's characterization of her substantive moral realism involves a further element and attributing to moral realism a treatment of the normativity of the moral under which there are intrinsically normative entities or intrinsically normative properties which by fear bring an end to the regress of questions why must i do that so i share christine Korsgaard's puzzlement about the idea of intrinsically normative entities they're not part of any metaphysics first moral realism of the kind i'm considering which could be called a kind of sober sober moral realism the sober metaphysics first theorist should agree there is a genuine question whether there are good reasons for promoting what's morally good to promote the metaphysics of morals so classified. Okay, um, let me speed on here because time is going um, very quickly. Uh, we know also from multiple discussions in moral philosophy that we need to distinguish the goodness of a state of affairs from the goodness of an action and the goodness of an agent. A morally good agent may not be required to produce a good state of affairs if doing so would involve egregious betrayal or would involve great harm to those the agent loves and so forth for many conceivable examples. It's entirely open to a metaphysics first moral realist to distinguish the properties of being a good state of affairs and the property of being a good agent and to provide realist treatments of each of those distinct properties. Being realistic about each of them doesn't mean that they can't diverge. Nor does realism about these properties mean that there must be some overarching truth about which of the two we should follow in the case of divergence. So here's another very general high level question that's probably arising in your mind. Is an investigation in what it is to possess moral concepts itself a moral investigation? There's almost a reflexive reaction on the part of a philosopher to say that it can't be a moral investigation. One's tempted to say, perhaps initially, the investigation into concept possession is a constitutive philosophical matter, not itself a moral matter. That may be a natural reflexive reaction. But that reaction involves overlooking a general point within philosophy itself, a point that applies to any case, every case indeed, in which individuation precedes representation. As I noted, the issue of what individuates a moral property, that metaphysical question, is itself a moral issue. It's a moral issue of what makes something a good state of affairs. Similarly, the question of what makes a proposition metaphysically necessary, that's a question of modal metaphysics. The question of what makes something the natural number zero is equally a question of the metaphysics of numbers. So a general domain independent philosophical principle applies in cases in which individuation precedes representation, the correct account of concept possession depends upon the metaphysics of the domain in question. If individuation does precede representation for morality, modality, and arithmetic, it follows that what it is to possess a moral concept depends on the nature of moral properties. What it is to possess a numerical concept 
depends on the nature of numbers and so forth. The respect in which the nature of, of the possession of moral concepts is not independent of nor certain normative matters is just a special case of this general point. It's independent of any particular subject matter. It applies in every case in which individuation precedes representation. Recognition of this point is not in conflict with the thesis that an account of possession of any given concept is a philosophical matter, but it does mean the philosophical account of concept possession must sometimes involve substantive investigation of the nature of the entities, properties and relations to which those concepts refer. I think this parts of philosophy can't proceed without some investigation of the nature of the world through which the concepts engage. Okay. Next section of this talk, I want to discuss moral realism and the etiology, the causal origins of particular moral beliefs. In a, a famous discussion, Gil Harmon discussed your judgment that it's wrong of a group of hooligans to set a cat on fire. And he famously wrote about the explanation of your judgment that it's wrong. There is, he said, and I'm going to quote Gil Harmon for a few sentences, he says, there's no obvious reason to assume anything about moral facts, such, that it, as, such as that it's really wrong to set the cat on fire. An assumption about moral facts would seem to be totally irrelevant to the explanation of your making the judgment you make. It would seem that all we need assume is that you have certain more or less well-articulated moral principles that are reflected in the judgments you make based on your moral sensibility. It seems to be completely irrelevant to our explanation whether your intuitive immediate judgment is true or false. That's the end of the quote from Harmon. Um, here's another quote from Richard Joyce of London in the same spirit. He writes, whenever we judge something morally wrong, there's a complete explanation of the judgment that neither presupposes moral facts nor acts as a reductive base of moral facts. I contend that on no epistemological theory worth its salt should the justificatory status of a belief remain unaffected by the discovery of an empirically supported theory that provides a complete explanation of why we have that belief, while nowhere presupposing it's truth. Okay, well, these statements by Harmon and Joyce um, may seem obviously true, but it's worth considering corresponding statements about other domains. Let's substitute an arithmetical example in the quotation from Harmon. For the belief that it's wrong to set the cat on fire, we can substitute the judgment reached by counting the children, that the sum of the five boys in the room and seven girls is 12 children in total. If we make that substitution in Harmon's claim, the resulting passage would read as follows. It would say, there's no obvious reason to assume anything about arithmetical facts, such as that it's really the case that the sum of five boys and seven girls is 12 children in total. Indeed, an assumption about arithmetical facts would seem to be totally irrelevant to the explanation of your making the judgment you make, it would seem that all we need assume is that you have certain more or less well-articulated counting procedures that are reflected in the judgments you make. It seems to be completely irrelevant to our explanation whether your arithmetical judgment is true or false. That's the end of the parallel quote. That sounds much less obvious. And I suggest that the claim of complete irrelevance of arithmetical facts is not true. In counting up seven steps from five to reach the answer that there are 12 children, 12 boys or girls, the, the more or less well-articulated counting procedures you use in reaching your judgment are procedures that respect what makes one number a success for another, and procedures that respect what make one number the sum of two numbers. The fact that five plus seven is 12 is a consequence of what makes one number a success for another, and of what makes a number the sum of two numbers. But those were the very principles you were using in reaching your judgment of five plus seven is 12. What makes the content of your judgment true are the very facts on which you relied on reaching it. So we should distinguish very sharply between the causal dependence of a judgment on facts about domain, and second, the use in reaching a judgment of procedures involving grasp of constitutive facts about properties and relations of the domain, procedures use of which correspondingly ensures the truth of judgments reached by use of those procedures. And I call procedures of the second kind, constitutively truth involving procedures, or truth ensuring procedures. Indeed, we do not have causal dependency 
of the first kind in the case of arithmetical or indeed modal or moral judgments. But I suggest we do have the distinctive use of constitutively truth ensuring procedures in the case of properly formed arithmetical, moral or modal judgments. Those two cases are two kinds of ways in which the truth of a content can be involved in how a judgment comes to be made. Causal explanation by the truth of what's judged is not the only way the truth of the judgment can be involved in how it comes to be made. Let's return to Harmon's discussion for a moment. Harmon is right to say we make an immediate intuitive judgment. It is wrong to set the cat on fire. But the judgment is nevertheless made for reasons. One of the reasons is that the fire causes unnecessary, and in this case, terrible suffering, and unnecessary suffering harms its subject, which is a wrong. That point would be included in what Harmon calls the thinker's more or less well-articulated moral principles. Knowledge of that reason for making the judgment of wrongness is founded in appreciation of the nature of the property of wrongness. Such knowledge is involved in the ability to think of the property of wrongness as such. So the moral case also falls under the second kind of case I mentioned. In the case as described, in coming to judge the hooligan's actions are wrong, the thinker is using constitutively truth ensuring procedures. That's also, of course, not a case in which the wrongness of an action diverges from the wrongness of the state of affairs involved. Well, you may object. You may say it's not the truth of propositions about the successor relation and addition that explains the thinker's eventual arithmetical judgment. It's merely that the thinker accepts those propositions. Well, that seems to me to be an understatement of the situation. The thinker has tacit knowledge of the relevant propositions as constitutive of succession and addition, as knowledge of what makes a relation that of succession or addition. It's part of the explanation of the thinker's use of certain principles that they are constitutive of the entities involved. And what's constitutive of something must be true of it. Well, you may come back and say, well, a thinker could be making a mistake in her tacit attitudes about what's constitutive of number or succession or addition. But I think that's not a real possibility. To lose or lack tacit knowledge of what individuates the number zero or addition is to no longer be capable of thinking of something as zero or as addition. Truth and grasp are not separable at that fundamental level. That a certain condition is constitutive being the addition function is part of the thinker's possession of the concept of addition, and hence part of the explanation of thinkers reaching the conclusion that there are 12 children in the room. To put this in a, um, in a slogan, the facts that make five plus seven to 12 true also contribute to the explanation of why the thinker comes to judge that five plus seven is 12. And I'd make exactly parallel cases claims in the count of um, metaphysical modality too. Okay, let me talk a little bit now again from 40,000 feet up about the contrast between um, this metaphysics first rationalist conception of morality and um, no priority positions and secondary quality style treatments of moral thought. The idea of these treatments is that Part of what's involved in, for example, a person's having a morally good character is that that elicits admiration or merits admiration. And that's said by proponents of these secondary quality views, be analogous to the fact that being read involves perceptions of redness as such. So on these views, what it is to have certain moral properties similarly involves eliciting with merit certain mental states, moral admiration, positive or negative emotions. So these are no priority views. These are clearly no priority views in the category, in the framework I outlined in the primacy metaphysics. Under these no priority treatments, the mental states involved in the metaphysics of what it is to have the moral properties involve conceptualization of that very property as a certain moral property. And the views of John McDowell, David Wiggins, both fall within that no priority category despite their differences. These no priority views are prima facie distinctively mind dependent accounts of moral properties in ways in which the metaphysics first rationalist option is not a mind dependent account. Um, that characterization is disputed by McDowell and, and Wiggins, but I'll uh, return to that in a minute. Um, I think it should be so characterized. So these no priority positions, they stand in contrast with the famous um, positions of Simon Blackburn and Alan Gibbard for quasi realists like Simon Blackburn. It's a mistake to think. There's any such topic as the metaphysics of the good, and the idea of the metaphysics of goodness is equally a mistaken idea under Alan Gibbard's expressivist views. I want to consider three problems that are distinctively no priority positions of McDowell or Wiggins, um, problems that do not arise um, on the 
rationalist realistic conception of morality. I think the problems are revealing in various ways. First problem for the low priority views is this. I call it the answerability to the holding of reaction independent conditions. This is a fundamental challenge for secondary quality inspired accounts. Such accounts in their treatment of some moral property F mention some emotion or sentiment that an action or institution is F in their no, in their no priority account of what it is to be F. But the rationality, indeed the morality of acting in accordance with emotions or sentiments seems to me always to be answerable to independent reasons, independent of the emotional sentiment for thinking that the action or institution really is F. Consider a feeling of guilt about some action. If there's no good reason for feeling guilty about it, no property of the action that was wrong, then that emotion of guilt is not a good guide to wrongness. If the representation or content of the moral emotional sentiment, its representation of something is good or bad in a certain respect, can't be justified, it shouldn't be mentioned in the account of what it is to have a moral property in question. Indeed, in those circumstances, it doesn't justify a moral judgment at all. That's not to deny that sometimes our emotions may be ahead of our considered rational judgment. Sometimes we may experience an emotion of guilt about some action, though we later come to realize the action was indeed wrong. That's entirely consistent with the thesis that when some action really is wrong, there must be something that makes it wrong. It's independent of the appearance of the emotion of guilt. The fact that sometimes the emotion of guilt may be epistemically more informative than our current judgment about an action doesn't contradict the constitutive thesis about what makes an action wrong. The constitutive point is acknowledged by John McDowell, for instance, when, as it seems to me, he rightly insists that a sentiment of admiration may exist, but a virtue is conceived as something that not only elicits the appropriate attitude, but merits it. And a similar point applies to the emotion of guilt, as I just argued. But here I think we have a major disanalogy with color. Color experience just happens to one. There are no further commitments beyond other possible experiences and their causes in endorsing a judgment of the content, judgment, um, endorsing in judgment the content of a color experience. There's no such thing as a further condition of meriting color experience. The idea of something meriting color experience doesn't make any sense. By contrast, you should endorse in judgment the content of a moral emotion that something is F, only if it's reasonable to think that there are emotion independent reasons for judging it to be F. And the same applies, it seems to me, to mental events of its striking one, something is good or right. Well, McDowell is a sophisticated philosopher, he's very sensitive to these points, and he moves to finesse this difference from classical secondary qualities by considering what he calls the property of fearfulness. And I agree, it does make sense to say that something merits fear. And McDowell says of fearfulness that it shares the crucial feature with the moral cases. I disagree, I think this is a false analogy. Fear, like other emotions, does have representational content. It represents some object or state of affairs as dangerous. But the crucial respect of disanalogy is that being dangerous is a condition specifiable quite independently of the emotion of fear. A situation that's dangerous to a subject is one that is at substantial risk of causing harm or damage to the subject. And harm and damage are not to be explained in terms of the emotion of fear. So being dangerous is not to be explained in terms of the emotion of fear. Since meriting fear is thus independently specifiable, the case of fear is not a no priority case. So when McDowell writes, for an object to merit fear is just for it to be a fearful, I disagree. For an object to merit fear is just for it to be dangerous. Note also that in other genuinely mind dependent cases, it makes no sense to say that the reaction is merited or not. Some things are indeed not appropriately laughed at or found amusing, such as attempted jokes that presuppose racism or prejudice or acquiescence and cruelty. But when the subject matter is not too serious for amusement, there's no question of meriting amusement. There's no failure to appreciate what's merited if one doesn't find something funny that other people do. But I think the same applies to pleasure in the sense of taste and smell. Second issue, mind dependence. The no priority positions of McDowell and Wiggins involve mind dependence because mind dependence should be characterized in terms of what makes something the case. According to the secondary quality view, what makes something right or wrong on the secondary quality view is a matter of which mental states 
even if justified mental states, it produces in certain specified circumstances. It does not suffice to this, to reply to this, to appeal to modal rigidification. That reply says that we can fix on what relevant mind independent property actually produces the mental reaction, and then insists that the existence of this mind independent property frees the secondary quality in spider cats from the charge of mind dependence. Both Wiggins and McDowell, oh, sorry, both Wiggins and Blackburn, despite their other differences, make this rigidification move. But actually, even the case of secondary qualities themselves shows the in inadequacies of this rigidification mood as a defense against the charge of mind dependence. The concept red is rigid in respect to the physical property it picks out. Even if humans had had very different perceptual systems, perhaps with spectrum inversion, the same objects as are actually red would still be red. That point hardly shows that color is not mind dependent. The right way to elaborate the claim of mind dependence is in terms of propositions about what makes something out of a certain property, rather than in terms of conditions of what metaphysical modality. Rigidification does not solve the constitutive challenge that equally arises for the various positions of Wiggins, McDowell, and Blackbird in various respects. Here I actually agree with the passing remark of David Lewis, where he writes, the trick of rigidifying seems more to hinder the expression of the worry than to make it go away. Okay, third issue, the issue of a priori status. In the case of metaphysical modality, there's a plausible general proposition. Any true proposition about metaphysical necessity is either a priori and necessary, or if the proposition is empirical, it's a consequence of two propositions, one of which is a priori and necessary, the other is both non-modal and empirical. For example, the general proposition of the identity of necessity is a priori. It's necessary for all x, x is into with x. Under this kind of position, it's agreed that necessarily Hesperus' phosphorus is a posteriori, but as a consequence, the necessity of identity, which is an a priori matter, and the entirely non modal a posteriori proposition, Hesperus' phosphorus. So, what's excluded by the plausible general position is a case that, of irreducibly necessary a posteriori. That is, a case of the a posteriori that's not a consequence of propositions that are either both a priori necessary or both a posteriori and contingent. And if indeed there are no such cases, that will be explained by the fundamental principles that individuate necessity having an a priori status. Exactly the same argument seems to me to apply to morality. It's a priori and necessary that it's good to do what reduces suffering, other things equal. It's often an a posteriori matter what in fact reduces suffering. It's hard to think of moral truths that are irreducibly a posteriori and necessary. And if indeed there are no such cases, that would be explained by the fundamental principles of individuating moral properties having an a priori status. Actually, naturalist railton like writers of metaphysics first treatments of morality could make the same point if that theorist is friendly at all to the notion of the a priori, because the naturalist could also say it's a priori that what promotes non moral goodness for subject is morally good. It's a posteriori matter what those things are. The fundamentally a priori character of the propositions of morality seems to me to pose a problem for the no priority views of McDowell and Wiggins. If what it is to be morally good or to have some other moral properties to be explained in terms of mental states, how can it be possible to know the proposition of morality a priori, justification independent of being in such states? That's a modern contemporary version of one of Kant's points against Hume, and it seems to me still to carry some force. And further discussion of those points is obviously going to depend on further elaboration of the notion of the a priori. Let me make a few remarks about the contrast between this kind of rationalist moral realism and expressivism. Um, uh, often in the rhetoric uh, surrounding expressivism, you'll get some kind of uh, uh, rhetorical dismissal of what's called Platonism about moral properties. Um, there is a kind of Platonism, I don't object to the term, um, about the, um, there's a kind of Platonism implicit in the rationalist uh, uh, moral realism that I'm adopting because we're talking about the nature of moral properties, um, they're not getting reduced to anything else, um, and they're being treated realistically. But in the expressivist account, you also get a positive treatment in um, expressivist literature of what it means to uh, say that something is right or wrong, what it is for someone to be blameworthy and so forth. And I want to contrast the kind of accounts they give with the accounts given by the rationalist moral realist, because it seems to me in this domain, the 
um, the rationalist moral realist um, uh, has a superior position. So expressivists um, proceed in various ways. Um, expressivists may initially be tempted to say that a type of action is morally permitted to say that is just to express acceptance of a set of norms, for moral judgment, to permit actions of that type. Obviously, that won't do because it uses the notion of moral judgment. Um, uh, and that problem uh, is pervasive um, if you just keep talking about terms of non, um, norms about what's moral to do. Um, if you just talk about norms about what to do, that certainly isn't going to capture morality. Um, Expressivists like Alan Gibbard, uh, again, are very experienced, sophisticated philosophers, they make, don't make any such mistakes. Um, uh, what Gibbard does is to give an account of um, moral judgments in the following way. He says, I'm quoting Gibbard's summary of his views. He says, I spoke of guilt and resentment. A person is to blame for something if it would make sense for him to feel guilty for having done it and for others to resent him for having done it. So he says, that um, a person is to blame for something if it would make sense for him to feel guilty for having done it and for others to resent him for having done it. Um, and that certainly involves, uh, certainly avoids subjections to naive expressivist accounts. Nevertheless, I think it's open to three objections, objections that I think generalize to other forms of expressivism. And the first objection is that it overlooks the most problematic circularity. Um, Alan Gibbard does consider the objection that his account of blame gets things backwards. So here's a quote from Alan Gibbard's 1990 book. He says, anger and guilt themselves include moral judgments, it's said. To be angry with a person is in part to judge he's acted wrongly, and to feel guilty is in part to judge that one has acted wrong oneself, acted wrong oneself. We can't explain moral judgments in terms of guilt and anger, for we must explain guilt and anger in terms of moral judgments. And Gibbard continues, I need enough of an account of emotions to cope with this objection. And to the objection as he formulates it, Gibbard eventually replies very reasonably, I can feel guilt inappropriately, I can feel it without being at fault, without thinking myself at fault. That is what happens when I realize that I feel guilt senselessly. My objection, as you might predict, is that Gibbard has not formulated or addressed the most problematic circularity concerning guilt. The most problematic circularity concerns not judgment, but the representational content of the emotion of guilt. It's in the nature of guilt that the emotion of guilt represents oneself as having acted wrongly. In feeling guilt, it seems one's acted wrongly, even if the content of this emotion is overruled by one's judgment that one did not act wrongly. That's structurally parallel to the case in which a perception represents something as being the case, e.g. the straw is bent in water, even though the subject of the perception, the perceiver, Overrules this, overrules this with the judgment of the straw, isn't there? If guilt involves the property of wrongness thought of as such, we cannot without circularity use the notion of guilt in the account of wrongness that claims to explain wrongness without using the concept of wrongness. The notion of guilt could of course be used in a no priority account of wrongness, but the expressive account is meant to be different from such a no priority account. Second objection concerns the account's use of the notion that it's making sense to feel guilty. I suggest that it makes sense to be in a state which represents a certain proposition as holding only if one has evidence that the proposition is true. It makes sense to feel guilty about an action only if there's some evidence that the action is wrong. But again, that involves the notion of truth or falsity, the proposition the action is wrong. That hasn't been explained in expressive terms. Um, uh, I'm not doing very well for time. I want to leave enough time for discussion. Let me um, let me speak very briefly about um, uh, the relation between rationalist moral realism and evolutionary accounts of uh, the benefits of having moral beliefs. Um, these issues have been very extensively debated in recent years, especially by um, uh, my New York colleague, uh, Sharon Street. Um, Particularly pressing has been the relation of moral realism to considerations of evolution and natural selection. In a very well known paper, Sharon Street writes in 2006 The challenge for realist theories of value is to explain the relation between these evolutionary influences on our evaluative attitudes on the one hand and the independent evaluative truths that realism posits on the other. 
Realism, I argue, she argues, can give no satisfactory account of this relation. It's the end of the quote. The moral realist of the rationalist kind that I've been articulating should not be disputing two points. The moral realist should not be disputing that belief systems that are adaptive will persist in a group. Nor should the moral realist dispute, as things actually are, that moral beliefs are largely adaptive. But the moral realist should distinguish two questions. What explains the persistence of moral beliefs in a community? And what explains why an individual acquires particular moral beliefs on a particular occasion? Different explanatory resources are needed in answering those two questions, and it doesn't answer the question of, of the explanation by the individual of moral beliefs to note that moral beliefs are adaptive by and large. That doesn't explain the etiology of moral belief on a particular occasion. Here, a partially parallel case may be helpful. We can expect the persistence of perceptual systems over generations in a type of organism, where these perceptual systems give adaptive information about the organism's environment. That fact does not release us from the obligation to give an explanation of how these perceptual systems on a particular occasion, a particular individual, succeed in supplying roughly correct information about the environment. And of course, perceptual psychology groups precisely aim to give explanations of um, how perceptual systems give roughly accurate information. However, it's certainly true that the moral realism I've been endorsing falls within the intended scope, within the target area of the second part of the dilemma that Street formulates uh, for this um, for moral realist. Again, to quote Sharon Street, she says, the realist's other option is to claim that there's a relation between evolutionary influences and independent evaluative truths, namely that natural selection favored ancestors who were able to grasp these truths. But this account, I argue, is unacceptable on scientific grounds. It's in the report. Street has a specific conception of what would be required for mind independent truths to be explanatory of someone's actions, and that conception is causal. She writes, a creature obviously can't run into such truths or fall over them or be by or be eaten by them, end of the quote. Well, I think the idea that natural selection favors ancestors who are able to grasp mind independent arithmetical truths ought to be not at all problematic. The account above of grasp of mind independent arithmetical truths, the account relying on the principle of individuation for these representations, explains how that can be so without any commitment to causal interaction with the natural numbers. Thinkers can form arithmetical beliefs on particular occasions by constitutively truth ensuring procedures, and those beliefs will, in appropriate circumstances, be adaptive. It's certainly adaptive to be right about arithmetic. Okay. Um, let me just note a further point here. It's important that on the account of arithmetic involving individuation perceived representation, there's a constitutive connection between the nature of a natural number n and the condition for it to be true that there are n things that are f, that are arbitrary property f. Under that account, it's impossible for the identity conditions of natural numbers to come apart from their role in application of numerical quantification. Um, and that's why it's adaptive to have uh, true arithmetical beliefs. Okay, let me summarize here so, um, so there's enough time for discussion. Um, what I've said in effect is that there's a position in logical space that identifies a rationalistic moral realism that treats it in very, very broad terms in the same way that rationalist treatments, metaphysics first treatments are available for um, metaphysical necessity and for um, the truths of arithmetic and also I would argue for real numbers as well. What we're doing in effect in the moral case when we offer this rationalist realist account is steering between Scylla and Charybdis. We're steering between the problems that you get if you have a mind dependent view, which is very implausible both for necessity and for arithmetic and for real numbers and in my view for morality. And on the other hand, steering between that and extreme versions of um, uh, certain kinds of realism that make arithmetical facts or modal facts or moral facts epistemically inaccessible and make the impossible to be known. What we have um, in rationalistic moral realism is a way to steer a middle course. It allows to have, without having mind dependence, we also have, in, we also have accessibility us also having a certain kind of objectivity. And um, though I haven't been able to defend this in detail, I, I commend that option to you. And I will stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.
there any questions? Yeah. Uh, Professor Peacock, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, yeah. Okay, uh, great. Uh, so, um, um, my question might be uh, a bit lengthy one, uh, but uh, well, I will start from your uh, 2004 book, The Rivers of Reason, uh, in yeah. which you um, offer some kind of uh, an explanation uh, for the entailment that we have to take our uh, perceptual beliefs at face value. And you offer something like an evolutionary um, explanation of this entailment. Well, first, you offer the explanation of entailment in terms of uh, we are entitled because it is likely to be true. And then you are explaining uh, the fact that uh, it is likely to be true by um, natural selection, basically. Uh, but what was absent uh, in your account, uh, to my mind, uh, is the parallel explanation of the parallel entailment that we have uh, in case of sort of uh, a priori knowledge and specifically in case of conceptions uh, that are based on uh, what you call implicitly known uh, principles. Uh, so one could always ask uh, uh, why uh, the belief in those implicitly known principles, both suppose we agree that there are some implicitly known principles that we believe to be true. Uh, but why, uh, how can we, uh, how can we justify our opinion that we have knowledge of those beliefs? And it seems that to do that, uh, we need to something parallel to the explanation of entailment uh, that you gave in case of perceptual beliefs and beliefs of uh, those kinds. And it seems to me that uh, um, in your uh, attempt to answer uh, Sharon Street, uh, uh, in your presentation, you did something like that. Um, you provided something like uh, an analogy for um, the case of uh, a priori knowledge and specifically moral a priori knowledge. So we have those, um, we implicitly know those principles because uh, there are evolutionary forces uh, that uh, sort of instill this kind of knowledge into us. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit further uh, on why do you think that uh, Street's uh, argument uh, uh, is not, not sound? Because it seems to me that uh, uh, there is a point uh, at which you stopped, and this is, uh, there is a point where she argues that uh, even if it is adaptive, uh, we can definitely explain why uh, it is uh, truth tracking, so to speak, to have uh, the kind of moral beliefs that we developed. Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Okay, thank you very much. Um, there, there are really two different strands to your question. Um, uh, the first strand um, concerns the question of um, whether in a certain range of cases we have good reason for believing that the representation or content of a certain kind of mental state is, is correct. Um, now, we can divide subject matters um, into a very, very broad general partition. There are those um, subject matters where it's very plausible that the, our account of the grasp of the concepts has to make mention of mental states with a certain kind of representational content. In our grasp of the spatial and temporal world, it's extremely plausible that understanding somehow or other involves um, temporal perception, spatial perception. And so the question in those cases of whether the representational content of the mental states is correct is, is pressing and urgent and interesting and significant. Um, in cases where understanding does not turn crucially on the um, certain kinds of mental states with representational content, um, those issues don't arise. So what's distinctive about um, the rationalist account of arithmetic, of metaphysical modality, of grasp of the real numbers, and also morality, if what I've been saying today is right, is that um, in those cases, 
there's nothing in those domains that plays the same role that perceptual experience plays in the case of the spatial and the temporal. Um, there is such a thing as um, understanding, of course, in these in these domains that have to be treated in a more rational way. But in the case, for example, of just grasp of the um, the concept of the number zero as being something such that the, that entity is such that there to be zero f's is going to be nothing that's f. Um, there's no question of some mental state with some representation or content um, being correct or incorrect. There is the question of how it, um, the basis of a think it's seeming to a thinker that there's nothing in the room and therefore that there's zero that there's no chairs in the room. Therefore, there's zero chairs in the room. Number of chairs in the room is zero. Um, but uh, that's that's just a, a seeming true. And the the actual account the account of grasp is one that allows no room for error. If if what it is to think of something as zero is to have tacit knowledge um, that uh, for there to be zero f's is for there to be nothing that's f, not the case there's something that's f. Um, then in using that in together with other other true beliefs and forming conclusions about the number of things in the room, um, uh, you, there's no possibility of, of going wrong. You might go wrong about um, uh, whether you've seen a chair over there in the corner or not. Um, but that's that's various kinds of empirical error. You're not making any error that's based on your grasp of what it is to be zero or one. Um, and I would say the same in the case of metaphysical necessity, I'd say in the case of grasp of the um, concepts of the real numbers as well. Um, so those two those two areas are very, those, that big partition between those domains in which you have to make some reference to a certain kind of mental state in this representation of context to give an account of understanding and therefore the question of um, whether you're justified in relying on that representation is correct, and those cases which you don't, that's that's the crucial that's the crucial distinction. And and the kind of seemings that are involved in the grasp of arithmetic or metaphysical necessity or morality um, are seemings that are um, based on understanding where the understanding consists in tacit knowledge of an individuating principle. An individuating principle is what individuates, can't be wrong. And in these cases, as I said, as in a slogan at one point in today's talk, um, this is a case in which um, gra grasp and truth can't be can't be separated. Um, okay, that that's the that goes to the first part of your question. It just indicates the region of logical space in which my answer would be <laughs> located. Uh, more to be said in all of that, especially on the nature of the a priori. On the second part of your question, um, uh, uh, it's certainly true that um, that moral beliefs are adaptive, and that um, we need to good, give a good account of why, in central cases at least, moral beliefs are adaptive and will persist in in a community. Um, equally, uh, arithmetical beliefs. It is adaptive to have true arithmetical beliefs. People who think that seven plus five is fourteen um, will not do well in life generally. Okay. Um, in their application of arithmetic. Um, so it's equally true that um, having arithmetical belief, having true arithmetical beliefs is adaptive. Does that show that um, arithmetical beliefs don't have a content, don't concern numbers? Not, not at all. Like we, we can give a perfectly good account of um, the content of arithmetical beliefs, account of grasp, account of truth, account of their mind independence, um, entirely consistently with its being adaptive to have arithmetical beliefs. Um, so I think the street argument does not does not get off the ground. You mustn't confuse the question of um, whether it's adaptive to have um, true beliefs of a certain kind with the question of whether the content of those beliefs um, concerns a mind independent reality. It's entirely consistent to say it's mind independent matters that make seven plus five equal twelve true, consistently with it being adaptive to have that belief. And I think. I think that Sharon Street has missed that option for, for various reasons. And one, one is that um, she hasn't considered the relation between abstract objects and applications. Um, and she's also considered only implausible kinds of moral realism. So that, that's an outline of the second component of your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so, uh, as I as I understand, implicit knowledge plays a crucial role 
in your account of uh, rational, realist, uh, moral yes. uh, conception. Right? Yeah. So, how general is the, is that uh, implicit knowledge in case of morality? Is it developed in an evolutionary fashion, so to say? I guess my ancestors I think, probably never faced a silicon life form. So, what about applying some um, moral uh, moral reasoning towards uh, silicon life form? For example, is it moral to kill a silicon based life form? Okay, so this, um, again, there's several there's several issues here. Um, I mean, there's just no question that even in the history of humanity as we have it in literary forms, there's some kind of development of moral thought. And it's true in the life of individual children. Development, developmental psychologists have really lovely results about children's gradual, gradual grasp of moral structures and, and how they're formed. So there is an element of um, historical acquisition, both in the life of the individual and in the life of a community. Um, uh, is it is morality somehow humanly and somehow a feature of humanity as opposed to other life forms? On the question of silicon life forms, I I regard the question of consciousness as absolutely crucial. Um, obviously, it's always bad to destroy complex, interesting things, but it's a different kind of matter. It's a different kind of issue whether if those life forms are, are conscious. I don't have any difficulty with the idea that silicon-based um, structures could could in principle be be conscious if sufficiently sufficiently structured. Um, but I think it would turn it would turn on that. Um, it is um, it is an interesting question you you raised at the start of your remarks um, about how general uh, the content of tacit knowledge is, and I regard this as a really substantive, interesting question. Um, so. If you take, um, I mean, I know from the conference program, there's uh, people who are interested in the philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of set theory here. Um, so the, our grasp of the concept of a set um, is an extremely interesting thing. It has a certain kind of generality. And when people discover, as Gödel quite rightly remarked, um, new axioms um, for set theory, sometimes you can see them as um, justified. Sometimes Gödel talked about the um, New axioms being implied by the concept. That's the phrase he used in the 1947 article, implied, implied by the concept. The idea is that you somehow have this um, grasp of a concept that goes beyond what we can immediately articulate, um, but makes it rational to accept a completely new axiom. And the same, the same is true of um, morality, I think. Um, so sometimes, um, uh, if you take something that's sometimes seen as a, as a new value, um, authenticity, being authentic in one's personal life. Um, sometimes we would say, well, that's, you know, that's something that's not there in earlier formulations of, of morality. Um, well, I'm, I'm not clear it isn't. You know, there's a question of um, openness and honesty and um, authenticity might be regarded as um, a fuller explication of what's involved in certain kind of openness in, in interpersonal relations. Um, but there will be some cases, there'll be some cases in which it's it's a mistake to say that um, some new axiom, some new moral principle is implicit in the conception we have and that really we're just doing further delineation, we're doing precisification, we're doing precisification rather than extracting something that was already there. Um, and that's that's a real distinction. Some, sometimes we are just doing precisification. Um, um, but one always has to be very, very careful that one hasn't overlooked um, some interesting deep feature of our, our concepts that show that what's involved really is um, pulling out something that's already there, as, as Leibniz said about uh, something in the model, um, as opposed to um, uh, stipulation or precisification. Those, those are really di different cases, I think. Okay, so any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's me again. Um, I have another question. Um, uh, you, uh, in your response, you said that, uh, if I understood you correctly, that uh, sort of purely a priori, a priori um, propositions are 
devoid of represent representational content. Uh, is this fair to what you said? Um, well, the, the official position is it, it's slightly more specific than that. It, um, the account of understanding or concept possession in the in the case of arithmetic or real numbers or modality or morality, the account of understanding does not rely on um, the capacity to be in representational states like perception or um, uh, right. it doesn't rely on the, uh, yeah so and in fact what um, the secondary quality view is we're trying to assimilate morality to secondary quality cases so yeah so, uh, so go, go ahead yeah yeah would it be fair to say that uh, there is not question of uh, a priori to sort of getting a grasp uh, onto the world uh, because uh, they sort of do not represent features of the world uh, the moral uh, properties and or uh, our medical properties are not strictly speaking the features of the world but are something else so would it be correct uh, in your view no, I don't think it would be correct. I, um, you know, the notion of the world you're using there is very, very problematic. I, um, so when I say that um, that's a natural number, the number itself, the entity itself, is individuated by the condition for being the number, um, that number of things. Um, that's a state. That's a. That's a. A constitutive statement about a certain entity, about the number one, the number zero, similarly about the property of metaphysical necessity. When I give an account of that in terms of um, uh, that something is necessary just in case um, uh, it respects all the, the constraints on the individuation of the entities and the concepts mentioned in the proposition that's said to be necessary. Um, Again, that's um, individuating, individuating the property, saying what, what makes that the property it is. But, you know, you can use the notion of the world in such a way that it's stipulatively restricted to the spatio-temporal, in which case, of course, numbers, evidence relations, justification, a whole lot of things wouldn't be in the world in that sense. But that's just a stipulative restriction. There's no ontological elimination of numbers or metaphysical necessity or moral properties um, on the view I've been offering. In fact, that's why I say it's a kind of, it's a kind of realism. I mean, you, you're taking the numbers is individuated by certain things, the moral properties is individuated by certain things, the metaphysical modality is individuated by certain conditions, um, and then you're tying grasp of those notions to relations to those properties and entities themselves. So the ontology is in no way eliminated or reduced here. Um, it's a so notion of the world um, just um, in accordance with quite on ontological commitment, everything I've said, um, involves ontological commitment to numbers, to moral properties, to modal properties. Uh, okay, uh, I think what I'm thinking about in um, uh, asking about the world, the notion of the world, is something uh, that um, in a way sort of resists uh, us, um, resists, um, resists making statements that are uh, sort of arbitrary, right? Um, uh, I uh, do not mean to imply that uh, I want to restrict the notion of the world to say physical world uh, only or something else. Uh, I am quite sympathetic actually towards moral realism and realism and arithmetics and so on. What I'm trying to understand, understand is the specifics of your position. Um, so, uh, because uh, when I read the book, uh, The Realms of Reason, it wasn't uh, sort of clear to me uh, what distinguishes uh, your account of uh, moral discourse and moral truth from uh, sort of an arbitrary discourse, uh, the uh, rules for which we came up and uh, we can uh, use those rules. And those rules are enough to individuate concepts and to uh, sort of uh, create borders for uh, this uh, discourse and to discipline it uh, in the right terms. 
but uh, if uh, it uh, has no grasp uh, into, on the world of some kind, um, it seems that uh, it is not easy to see why we should uh, regard this kind of discourse as significant as we would certainly like to regard moral discourse and we would like to be able to expl explain why it is significant and it has uh, significance it has. Yes. Okay. Ex excellent question. Um, so let's distinguish two kinds of arbitrariness. And I think your question is about the second one. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing arbitrary about truth in arithmetic. Um, you know, the, the truth of arithmetical propositions is all determined by the basic individuation of natural numbers and the success on addition relations and so forth. Um, but there is a question um, about morality, which has no analog about arithmetic, which is about variant concepts. Why? What is of interest or importance about morality as opposed to morality star, where we just change some of the principles in some arbitrary way or restrict some them or add some others or remove some others? Um, and so there, your question about arbitrariness is important and pressing, um, uh, because the question is, I may have given a good account of um, a rationalistic moral realism, but someone may say, why should we care about that property? Why should we, as you just said in your question, why should we think it's so important? And that's a good and important question. And um, I think it has to be answered by, the, um, by reference to the content of morality. So um, this is a substantive question in moral philosophy, um, but it's, it's clear and it's often been discussed by moral theorists that um, the moral principles we actually accept um, all contribute in certain ways to certain goals. They involve equal respect for persons, for instance. They involve um, a conception of it being important that conscious beings flourish in certain ways and so forth. And um, what's, what it would be nice to show, and this is a substantive task in moral philosophy, and in some, many ways I'm not, not a moral philosopher, um, to show that um, any variance, any any different accounts of morality prime, well, morality asterisk, as you, they say, Matty Eklund and Justin Clark Doan, um, to show that those don't respect um, various constraints that our actual morality does respect. Um, so, so your question is an excellent one. It needs answering, needs answering by reference to the content of morality. And um, that's, that's a further task. And um, you're quite right, that, that needs to be done. So there's really two questions. There's one is, um, what is morality? What is it to grasp the concept of the moral? Um, and I've answered, tried to answer those questions, but I haven't at all addressed the question, um, why, what is significant about this, this particular concept? That, that's a good and important question and needs an answer. I think some of the resources are evidently there in, in the counter morality, but it's, it's hard work. It, need, it needs to be done. Yeah. So it's right. a good Thank and important issue. Yeah. Okay. So any other questions? No. Then another question from me. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, according to Gödel, mathematical facts force us to accept intuitively mathematical true axioms, which are uh, analogs of uh, physical laws of nature. Um, are we, according to um, rationalist metaphysics, just moral realism forced to forced to accept moral principles in a kind of analogous way and is it possible to develop some different kind of moral principles okay good well i'm, I'm very glad you bring up the parallel with Gödel because um Gödel was in many ways an arch arch rationalist but he was a very extreme one because he kept talking about there being analogs of perception he kept saying that mathematical or set theoretic intuition was some kind of analog of perception. Um, I think he didn't need to say that. I think what's deep and right in Gödel um, is what he often is, is in what he says about um, certain things being, and he used this phrase which in itself is structurally puzzling but nevertheless captures an important point, um, implied by the concept. Um, so his idea was that there's such a thing as understanding, even in the case of primitive logical constants, there's such a thing as understanding, and it's because of that understanding 
that we accept certain laws as correct. This is one of the reasons he's so hated Carnap's treatment of um, you know, rules of language that you just stipulate one um, and any old any old uh, set is fine as long as it's consistent. Um, uh, when you look at Erdl talk, talking about axioms and acceptance of new principles, um, he actually talks about two kind two kinds of justification. There's what you might call, uh, um, and some right, later writers have called external justification. That is, you accept a new principle or axiom because it has a huge number of consequences that are, are, are propositions that you already know to be true. It unifies the domain in various ways. Um, but there's, and that's analogous to um, discovering a new physical law. It explains lots of things you already knew to be the case. Um, and perhaps explains some new things you discovered to be the case as well. But he distinguishes that from this kind of internal justification where something's implied by the concept. And that, um, um, that distinction we can also make in the case of moral principles. Often when people are discussing hard cases um, in the ethics of reproductive technology and whatnot, we have intuitions about particular examples, um, and then you see, oh yes, they'll be unified by the following kind of principle about consent or understanding. Um, but then there's also a question of whether these, this new principle that's perhaps initially reached by its explanatory power can itself be justified <clears throat> on the basis of the concepts of morality, of agency, and responsibility, knowledge, and so forth um, that you already have. And the, the most rationalistic aspects of Gödel, which I think are most promising for the development of rationalist epistemology, are those where he's discussing what's, what's implied by the concept. When you look at current treatments of um, you know, huge, large cardinal axioms in set theory, um, people quite rightly distinguish two kinds of justifications for acceptance. One is via their consequences, they explain various things we already know, perhaps explain various things that we can independently discover to be true that we didn't already know to be true. But there's also a much more interesting case in which that new proposed axiom itself has a rationale in the concept of set. So um, the notion of a set, it goes beyond just the iterative conception. Um, it has various structural properties um, that people have discussed when discussing reflection axioms. Um, it, it's, a rich, it's a rich notion. And in a certain sense, you want anything to be able to count, count as a, a set as long as you're not, not getting a contradiction. Um, if there's some rationale for including um, uh, these sets. Um, and so a new axiom may be justified in either of those two ways, so either by its consequences or by having some rationale um, by the very concept of a set. And I would say the same of new, new moral principles, new, new moral axioms as well. Um, so the Gödel discussion is, is very helpful, interesting in sorts of ways. I think the point at which I wouldn't want to follow him is when he says that the, um, the bar, Arithmetic and set theoretic intuitions um, are to be treated as analogous to sense perception. That causal model will take you off the rails here. It will, it will not give you any good account of why these things are a priori. It won't give you an account of why they're necessary. But that's bad. But I think we need a kind of moderate, moderate rationalism that recognizes those kinds of insights, but doesn't, doesn't appeal to some obscure quasi-causal faculty. Okay, uh, if I remember correctly, lately Gödel claimed that the continuum hypothesis is false, despite... Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah. He did, yeah. yeah, that's right. Despite um, yeah. he believed that it is true. <laughs> so, yeah. he was forced to accept it in the first place, and then he was forced to accept that it is false. How yeah. a moral realist can guarantee that one forced to accept the true moral no, I... I, you know, that we, we change our moral views on all kinds of things. Um, and uh, I think it's, often, it's very striking, Gödel's change of view on that was um, prompted by his recognition, I think, of the, the richness of intuitive concept of set um, under which this, this thing, the continuum hypothesis couldn't, couldn't possibly be true. We had just a um, you know, much, much richer um, conception of the, of, um, of the domain of sets. Uh, so, we, we change our minds to moral principles all the time. And I think in the case where our change of mind is really going in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction, not incompatible with realism at all. It's, it's a question of whether the principle we now, um, we now accept or now reject um, is one that can be founded in um, our, our tacit knowledge of those, those principles of morality. That, that's what I think is the, is the question. But yeah, there's no epistemic 
assurances anywhere in this kind of realism anywhere as there is you know we make mistakes about modal thought as well that's entirely consistent with changing our mind is consistent with the basic account being that of a um a rationalist uh, realist so any any other questions <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yeah i thought about it. um are you familiar with uh, Derek Parkett's approach to moral uh, to establishing a moral realist position? I am, uh, yes. Yes, and if so, how would you classify him within your framework? I mean, uh, would you say that he is what you call a faculty rationalist? Because he does kind of believe that there are things out in the world, uh, the uh, irreducibly normative uh, entities, reasons, and that that is what we grasp uh, when we grasp uh, what it is to be a reason for something and so on. But on the other hand, he uh, is very insistent that uh, it is a non-causal causal faculty and that uh, the relation that we have to uh, those kind of, of entities are non-causal ones. So, yeah. in your terms, would he still be a faculty, a uh, moral realist, uh, faculty rationalist, or perhaps uh, the differences between his position and yours are purely superficial? Um, some of the differences are superficial and some of them aren't, I think. Um, so, obviously, there is somewhere or other that we come to know truths about, about what's a reason for what. Um, so we have that capacity. If you want to say it's a faculty, it's just a trivial reformulation. Um, I would prefer to um, do things in terms of um, a tacit knowledge of what makes something a reason for something else. Uh, but that's, that, that may, be a, may, may well be a trivial difference. Um, the issue about reducibility is very complex and interesting. So um, uh, it may, it's, it's consistent to believe that the normative in general is not reducible to something else. Um, but it may be consistent within that general, very general background thesis of irreducibility um, to accept that some norms can be explained in terms of other norms. So, so um, certain norms, so if you take norms for rational judgment, norms for um, making a judgment on the basis of certain kinds of evidence, um, there's a very reasonable case to be made that um, these norms are derivative from the aim of judging only what's true. You have the general background, judgment aims at truth, um, you aim to judge something only if it's true, and the various norms for making judgments um, are derivative from that. Now, if you, if you accept that, um, that's, that means that certain kinds of reasons for judgment can be explained in terms of um, some more general norm, the norm of um, aiming, judging, aiming to judge only what's true. That wouldn't take these reasons out of the domain of the normative altogether. The notion of truth, you know, it can't really be separated from the notion of the content of judgment. It's got its home in this network of relations. Nevertheless, some norms, um, some reasons could be explained in terms of other normative notions. Um, and so I would separate very sharply the question of the irreducibility of the normative, which I certainly do believe in, from um, what Tim Scanlon calls reasons primitivism, that, um, that uh, something's being a reason for something else can't be explained in any other terms, not even any other normative terms or terms relating to rationality. I'm, I'm much more skeptical of the second claim, and I don't think it needs to be part of the um, general conception of irre irreducibility. Um, so that's locating a position in, in logical space for you. Um, so there's, the, there's some aspects of the path of view I'm very sympathetic with. Um, uh, I think the talk of uh, a faculty, if it, if it means something causally sensitive, it, it, he rejects that too. If it means explained by, well, that explained by could be accommodated within, indeed it's, it's there in the account of individuation precedes representation. The representation of precisely is sensitivity to what individuates something. Um, and so it might be that you can apply the same apparatus for reasons generally that I applied, I've applied to morality. I haven't given any kind of reduction of morality in this, in this um, treatment I've been offering. Um, so uh, yeah, the, 
the overall answer to you is that you, you could you could these two positions could dovetail. This kind of um, general rationalism about certain kinds of domains and the puppet style and kind of reasons could be meshed with one another. But you have to be very careful um, that that's done in a way that doesn't preclude the explication of certain kinds of normative notions, like reasons for judgment, in terms of other notions that are also also normative. I think some kind of theory probably that is possible there. Thank you very much. So, in fact, I have some more questions, but we already are running low on time. And 10.32, like yeah, so bad. Yeah. And I'd like to spare my colleagues, so I propose to conclude our discussion. Many thanks for joining us and for your talk. Thank you very much, I enjoyed it.